Welcome to SACC's first podcast of our fourth unit. We're going to be talking about the periodic table, and I know we've been looking at it, but now we're going to go into more detail. So having a periodic table out in front of you as we're getting into it a little bit later in the notes will probably help a lot. Okay, a little bit of history. Um, it was in 1790s, the very first periodic table, we, they started making a list of what they knew. And in the 1790s, they only knew 23. But by 1870, they had approximately 70 known elements. Um, some of the later ones were noble gases, and the gases that were hard to see and they didn't react, those are hard to identify. Um, John Newlands, he's the very first to start arranging them, and he arranged them by atomic mass. We know today we don't use atomic mass, we use atomic number, but even by arranging them by atomic mass, he started to see some properties, and he's the very first that used the word the periodic, meaning um, just they arranged in periods that you start to see some patterns. Well, his patterns, if you looked at his rows, they would actually be very similar to our columns that we have today. So Newlands is one of the first ones put it together. Then we have two people, Mendeleev and Mosley, started arranging them. And Mendeleev took the rows of periodic table and he actually looked at the properties and he put them into the columns. He published his table first, hence why he gets a lot of his credit for doing the, um, we call it Mendeleev's periodic table, because it's published first. And that should be, if you ever have an invention or something, get it published. The key thing with Mendeleev, he left room for elements that he um, knew or predicted should exist and that were later, yes, they did exist and they fit into the periodic table. So he used chemical properties and physical properties to arrange them. Um, he did have some problems. They didn't quite fit, but again, for a first start going through it, it was really it was pretty good. Mosley is um, credited for identifying the number of protons, the atomic number, and he arranged the elements by atomic number. Now Mosley, he didn't um, identify the proton existed, but he just the each element he has a unique number, and the proteins, excuse me, protons are the ones responsible, and he's the one who arranged them, and again, starting to see that pattern. Um, this is just a view, if you see Mendeleev's table, if you Google it, it's handwritten. This, as you can see, was redrawn, but he left some blanks up here at the top. Up here at the top, this is where he's looking at the compound and looking at the reaction. So they're looking at the oxide. So R is just some generic compound. That's what the R stands for. It's not really an element because we don't have an element that starts with R. So that's why he's using it. And he's looking for the patterns. So these were the patterns as you went down the group. And as you can start to see, they are the group one, group two, and he's giving them the names and he's getting them an organization. Now if you notice, there isn't, these are transitions, didn't quite have a, the place in them. There's no noble gases because, again, noble gases didn't have any reactions. There was really no way for them to know that they existed in the 1870s. So from this comes the periodic law. That was my gavel on the back. And now again, it's a law of nature. It just means that it's a statement based on known facts. And the periodic states, you don't have to write it like this. This is just was my play on having it be more legal. When the elements are arranged in order of increasing atomic number, there is a pattern. You see a pattern in physical properties and you see a pattern in chemical properties. There's a reason they are arranged the way they are. So let's tie the periodic table to the configuration. So configurations, 1s2, 2s2s, it can explain the chemical properties. And that's what we've already started looking at when we, we talk about how many valence electrons they have. What charge do they make? We'll be using that fact over and over again when we look at how they combine to make compounds. So what happens again, it's those highest energy levels are the same. And remember, what did we call those? One, two, three, everybody yell it out. Yes, you're right, valence electrons when you're going through that. That's what we're interested in and that's what the major of our focus is going to be is on those valence electrons. So the, there you go. That was the word that you need. So hopefully you didn't even need me to turn the slide because you already knew that. 
And again, this should just be reviewed that the valence electrons are those highest shell electrons. They're your highest S and P electrons. So let's look at this little chart. Okay, let's look at across the period. And so technically, if you look across the period, you don't really say that the period equals the energy level. It does for some. So let's look at your, go across the first period of your periodic table. There's only two elements. They are all on the one S orbital. Okay, then you go across your second period. Now there's eight elements because you have your 2s, and again, there's two electrons in there, and there's the 2s2 and the 2p6. That's get your eight electrons. They're all in the second energy level. So period does equal energy level there. Third period, again, you have 3s2 and you have 3p6. Again, eight electrons, eight elements. Now look at what happens in the fourth period. Because all of a sudden in a fourth period, we have 18 elements. You have a 4s, you have a 3d, and you have a 4p6. Then you have your fifth period. Fifth period, if you go across it, also has the 18, the 4s, and again, there's two in here, we know that, and there's the 10 and the d's, 10, and you have your 5p6. Okay, then in the six, look at what happens. You have your 6s2, then you have a 4f14, then you're going to come back into a 5d10, then a 6p6. Hmm, I think there was maybe a test question like this, which filled first? And you just kind of have to look at what filled first. So if you add this all up, well, it's going to be 14 more electrons than an 18, so that has 32 electrons. Same thing in our seventh period. There's really, excuse me, 32 electrons, yes, but that means there's 32 elements in the sixth period. Same thing, because we have two, and that we are filling in this 7s. Look at all the different energy levels being filled as you go further down the periodic table. And then we're going to go into a 5f. Then we'll have a 6d. And then we're going to be filling in a 7p. So here has two energy levels. Okay, also two energy levels. Okay, this just has one, one, one. Then look what happens down here. We have some in the four, and in the five, and in the six. Now it's taking three energy levels. Same thing down here, three energy levels. And remember, as you get further away, the higher this electron, uh, higher the energy level, it means it's further away from the nucleus. So if you're getting further away from the nucleus, you're having more space. And it's just kind of, again, that's what these con orbitals are telling us. It's just where the electrons are in that atom. And the S, P, Ds, and Fs are just naming the areas. Okay, you have a quiz tomorrow. On your quiz, you need to know the names of the groups. We've talked about this in class today. And the quizzes, element quiz will look a little bit different. I'll give you the AP periodic table that has the elements, just their symbols. But I'm going to just ask you, okay, give me some elements in each of the groups. So I want you to know the group names and the element names. So group ones, alkalize. You need to know that their reactivities are very, very high. Now, do you need to know the reactivity for the quiz tomorrow? No. Do you need to know for the test? Yes. Okay, group two, alkaline earth metals. Their reactivity is also high, not as high. Group one is the highest. So high, these do not exist in nature. Do not exist as free elements, excuse me, what that means, you can't just walk along and find a piece of sodium. I can walk along and find a piece of iron. I cannot walk along and find a piece of sodium. You can find sodium chloride as a compound, but you can't find the elements as a free element. They're just too reactive. And when they're reactive, that means they're going to be forming compounds. That's what we um, mean when we say something is reactive. It's going to have a reaction and therefore form a compound and not just be in its pure elemental stage. Okay, halogens then. Let's go on the other side. Group 17. Group 17 are your halogens. They are your most reactive nonmetals. 
all about valence electrons. Group 1s have one. They really want to get rid of that one to have that stable, lower, lower energy, noble gas configuration. Halogens have seven valence. They really want that one more valence electron to also have that stable, lower energy configuration. Okay, group 18s, reactivity very, very, very low. Most of the time we say they're inert. Inert means they do not react. Vocab word I would know. Um, and remember, a side note there. Um, helium really has a 1s2 configuration, but its properties are much more, in fact they have nothing like an alkaline metal because they're not even a metal, they are a gas and they are a noble gas, they do not react, and it's because they have the full configuration, the full orbital, that's what gives them the similar properties. So even though they have a group 2 configuration, they're in group 18 because their properties are more like the properties of group 18. Okay, let's be more general then. How about S block? Well, look at down your S block. This is where I said if you had the periodic table. They're all metals except, except hydrogen. We just don't know where to put hydrogen. Hydrogen should really be a lone wolf kind of off by itself because really its properties are more in line with um, group 17 just as far as it's a gas. Um, hydrogen sometimes is a plus one, but it likes to form covalence. So hydrogen just knows kind of a lone wolf. We really don't know where to go. It, it's in group one because it does have the S1 configuration, but its properties, it is not an alkali metal. You do not put hydrogen as an alkali metal. P group, okay, look at the P group. This is the most diverse, okay, most diverse. Because look at what is in that P group. You have, because remember we have our stair step and the stair steps metalloids. Okay, so everything on this side is metals. So you have some metals underneath here on the P block. Over thing over here, this is a nice straight, these are my non-metals. And then remember, we had not aluminum, but the other ones boarding the line, those were your metalloids. So the P block has everything. But look what happens. As you go down, it becomes more metallic more metallic as you go down the P block. You just see an increase in the metallic properties as you go down the P block. Okay, how about the D's? Those are your transition metals. Transition metals. And we're going to talk about the transitions. This means their valence electrons changes. And it, what happens is sometimes they lose S electrons and then they can lose S and D electrons. So you don't get quite the consistency, but we do know these are very stable. They tend to be more of our stable. And look at what's in there, copper, gold, platinum. That's where we make the elements. And it's a good thing that those are not reacting as you are making jewelry out of them. Probably not a good selling point. Okay, then down here in the F block, and I'll be honest, we don't really worry about the F blocks very much. The lanthanides um, are a group. This is your 4F. So those are your lanthanides. They're also called the rare earth. We have a movie and I just actually found out some facts about it. Some of the lanthanides are fa um, finding out are actually natural shark repellents and they're looking to make be making shark hooks out of them and hoping to um, reduce the shark kill from it. I didn't know that, but it's just with some of their magnetic properties, sharks don't like the rare earth elements. And then you have actinides. These are your five Fs. Um, they're all radioactive. Really, the only time we're really going to be even worried about these guys are when we get into nuclear, which will be the next unit. That's about the only time we'll talk about. And probably if you look, you've seen some of those, uranium, plutonium, and when they talk about nuclear uh, materials, those are the elements that they are talking about. Okay, now you have a chart. We're going to come back and kind of talk about that chart in just a minute. So go ahead and skip down beneath. Okay, I talk about metals, non-metals, um, metalloids. I want you to make sure you know the properties. So write down some of the properties. And what will happen is you can identify if an element has these properties, therefore you identified it as an element. So metals, good conductors of heat and electricity. That means it can flow. Heat flows. Electric 
electricity flows. When we start talking about bonding, we will come back and talk more about this. Why does this happen? How come metals are good conductors? And we will look at what happens with that electrons. And the electrons are actually a sea of electrons, so they can flow through it. But like I said, we will come back and talk about that. Okay, another vocab. Malleable. Then remember, that means you can roll it or hammer it. This is why you can get sheet metal. You can get sheet metal. Okay, ductile, same thing. This is why you get wires. Okay, again, tends to be solids. Remember, poor old mercury. Not poor old mercury. Mercury is actually very cool. Remind me to tell you why we can't play with mercury, though. Um, anybody know the story of the Mad Hatter? See if you know the story from the Mad, of the Mad Hatter from Alice in Wonderland. We'll talk about that. Okay, non-metals. Not nearly as um, specific. Pretty much, if it does not have the property of a metal, uh, we'll classify it as a non-metal. Then you have your low metalloids, but that's pretty much what happens. So it's pretty much the opposite. They're poor conductors of heat and electricity. Okay, I have, it, pretty much if it's a gas, though, you know, ding, 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 non-metal. But liquids, okay, if you look again in the pure state, the only liquid really is um, bromine. And they can be solids. There's carbon, there's um, sulfur, iodine. We have definitely more solids also. I would also add brittle, kind of opposite of ductile. Um, if they're brittle, then you know, but you have to be careful with this because ionic compounds. So again, we're talking about the pure element, not the compounds. So we would say more than opposite of ductile, would say that a solid is brittle. Um, also, look at the periodic table. There's just fewer, much fewer non-metals than metals. And remember that stair step. Okay, so then your metalloids. Elements on both sides of the stair step, not aluminum. Okay, not aluminum. Remember aluminum, even though it's on the stair step, its properties are of a metal. They have the characteristics of metals and nonmetals. And we will pull some of these elements out and show you it, and you, you can be able to see these properties. And so that you can see the conductivity and see what the properties, see what a lot of these elements will look like. So we will have some samples that you can look at. Um, all the metalloids are solids. They're also called semiconductors. Silicon, Silicon Valley. Silicon is used as a semiconductor in computers. We'll show you some silicon. It's pretty. It's a very pretty element, but it can conduct electricity. But it's light. It's much lighter than metals. But you try to hammer it, and it's going to shatter. So it's got properties of both. That is what a metalloid does. Okay. So again, on the periodic table, this is where you can kind of visualize. All of my non-metals, remembering hydrogen is a non-metal, even though it's on the left side. Hydrogen really is properties over here. Hydrogen, again, the lone wolf, it is a on the metal side, but it's a non-metal. All the blues are my metals. Pinks are my metalloids. The yellows are my non-metals. Okay, back to this chart. So what I want you doing is just kind of going from a configuration Tell me what that element is, then figure out, okay, block. When it says block, I'm talking about is it an S, P, D, or F? What period is it in? What group is it in? Okay, if it has a group name, if name, what is it? Not everything has a group name. So when I'm talking about group names, 1, 2, 7, 18, and you can pretty much put 3 through 12. If it's a transition, go ahead and call it a transition metal. Okay, then just classify it, metal, non-metal, metalloid. Reactivity, go back to in your notes and find the reactivity as you're looking through that. Now, something like the lanthanides down here, this won't have a group name. Don't worry about that as far as the group name. And again, if it doesn't have a group name, then don't worry about naming it. Okay, that is what else you need to finish. That's what we're going to be looking at tomorrow when we're doing our stamp. And get ready for your element quiz. We will see you tomorrow. <laughs>